The history of Japan has been remarkable in a number of ways, and in some ways unique. Japan remained isolated from the rest of the world for two centuries, before American naval power forced the Japanese government to open up their ports to the outside world in 1854. Japan is also one of the few major nations of modern times to have a racially homogenous population. Until 1945, the Japanese were also one of the few major nations or races never to have been conquered. Japan is often thought of as a small country, but its area is larger than that of Great Britain, though smaller than that of California. Japan's vast economic output has tended to cause it to be compared to giant countries such as the United States and Russia, the only nations with a larger total output, and hence to be seen as little. But Japan is larger than a number of European nations, including Italy as well as the United Kingdom. In the past, Japan's successful wars against China, 1895, and Russia, 1905, likewise led to size comparisons with huge nations. Japan's gross national product is larger than that of all Latin America or the entire continent of Africa. In another sense, however, Japan is smaller than it appears to be. Its hills and mountains leave relatively little land suitable for agriculture, and it has little of the natural resources required by a modern industrial economy – iron ore, coal, petroleum, copper, lead, and zinc, all of which have to be imported. Yet this meager natural resource base has to support the most densely populated major nation in the world. Land suitable for farming has not only been scarce, but scattered, in narrow river valleys or in mountain basins, or along a coastal strip, so that Japan developed historically as a fragmented collection of settlements and domains. Even after a unified nation emerged, its prefect boundaries generally followed lines of natural geographic barriers that had historically divided the country. Japan's rivers were usually navigable only for short distances, and so did not serve to knit the land together. The sea was Japan's great waterway, however, which meant that the coastal areas were in communication, even if the hinterlands were not. Still, no part of Japan is more than 70 miles from the sea, though that distance was more formidable in the centuries before the modern transportation revolution. Before the coming of Western science and technology, Japan was a poor country, and remained so for many years, even after its military power became impressive in the late 19th century. It has also been, historically, an isolated country. Just as Britain was once isolated by being off the mainland of Europe, Japan's historic development has taken place off the mainland of Asia, but several times farther off. Although Chinese cultural influences penetrated and transformed Japan more than a thousand years ago, Japan remained an isolated nation, developing, adapting, and modifying the Chinese cultural contributions in its own way. Until the development of ocean-going commerce in recent centuries, Japan had only the most intermittent contact even with Korea and China, much less with the world at large. There has been virtually no significant immigration into Japan and the non-Japanese peoples in the country amount to less than 1% of its population. The forcible destruction of Japan's isolation by American naval vessels under Commodore Perry in 1854 was a turning point in Japanese history. It also demonstrated, with painful clarity, Japan's weakness and backwardness compared to advanced Western industrial nations, and set the national agenda for Japanese development in the century that followed. Imitation of the West, admiration of the West, resentment of the West, and both national and racial ambivalence toward the West dominated Japanese thought and action in the generations that followed Perry's fateful opening of Japan to the outside world. The United States, as the country powerful enough to break through Japan's historic isolation, was a special focus of Japanese attention. The American way of life was praised by Japanese leaders and intellectuals of the Meiji era. The United States was depicted as a benefactor to Japan by ending its isolation, and government-issued textbooks held up Abraham Lincoln and Benjamin Franklin as models to be imitated, even more so than Japanese heroes. English was introduced into Japanese secondary schools in 1876, and there was even a suggestion that it be made the national language.
euphoric descriptions of the United States as an earthly paradise were part of a general depiction of Western peoples and nations as enviable, beautiful, and great. Some enthusiasts not only adopted Western fashions, but even engaged in sweeping denigrations of all aspects of Japanese culture. Alongside such feelings, however, alternating with them and eventually overpowering them, was a growing Japanese desire to prove themselves and to assert their own identity and mastery. By the early 20th century, Japan had changed radically to become an ultra-nationalistic country, shrill and belligerent toward other nations and fanatically devoted to their emperor. The Japanese themselves often saw these traits as defensive overcompensations for a sense of inferiority. Those Japanese who immigrated to the United States earlier, during the Meiji era, were not brought up with such fanaticism, and Japanese-American writings critical of emperor worship or ultranationalism were often banned in Japan. By the Taisho era, 1912-1926, this nationalistic and racist arrogance and fanaticism were well underway in Japan. It was the immigrants of this era who settled in Brazil, carrying with them ideas that led to the tragicomic denouement of their preparing to welcome victorious Japanese troops at the end of World War II, while Japan itself lay prostrate and hungry amid the rubble. The consuming desire to prove something to themselves and to the world has been reflected in many aspects of modern Japanese history, especially the scope and nature of its wars and conquests. A Japanese editorial response to Japan's victory over China in 1895 saw it as demonstrating not only the military power of Japan as a nation, but also that the Japanese people are not inferior to any race in the world, and declared, we can hardly bear the happiness in our heart. Victory over Russia in 1905, the first time a modern Asian nation had defeated a European nation, produced similar responses. Japan's conquests of the 1930s and early 1940s were marked by a special ruthlessness, murderous cruelty, and pointless humiliations of the conquered peoples, all characteristic of people trying to prove something. They're slapping the faces of men on the streets for no reason, and for brutal tortures, mutilations, and executions of captured soldiers and civilians alike. The infamous Bataan Death March, where several thousand captured American and Filipino soldiers were brutally and often sadistically killed, was part of this general pattern. Post-war Japan has been one of the economic miracles of history, emerging not simply as an imitator of Western technology, but as a pioneer in its development and application. The social and political miracle has been no less profound, an historically militaristic society becoming one of the most pacifist, and a nation of autocratic despotism becoming one of the leading democracies of the world. Much of this was the work of just one man, General Douglas MacArthur, who politically maneuvered his way to become the de facto ruler of post-war Japan and the shaper of its institutions and even its psyche. While MacArthur was implacable in his retribution against generals and top politicians responsible for Japan's war atrocities, he was equally rigid in his insistence that American troops repeat none of such behavior in their occupation of Japan. For one of the few times in history, a conquering army was ordered to live only on its own rations, and neither to take nor buy food needed by the hungry conquered people. MacArthur became a national hero to the Japanese for his shrewdly displayed kindness, generosity, and democratic actions. A new pro-Americanism was rekindled in Japan among a people whose wartime government had led them to expect a nightmare of horrors if Americans conquered their land. Some of the prominent and enduring traits of the Japanese people seem to reflect the peculiar circumstances of their environment and history. Their enormous capacity for sustained and meticulous work is readily understandable in a people whose food has had to be produced from relatively small amounts of not very fertile land, intensely cultivated and irrigated. The large irrigation systems on which their survival depended required much cooperation among people in a given area and subordination of individual interests and idiosyncrasies to the common good. Their meager produce and thin margin of subsistence required an ability to live on little and put aside reserves for contingencies. The natural disasters to which Japan was particularly subject 
earthquakes, typhoons, and volcanic eruptions were reflected in a stoicism and tenacity that have marked the Japanese facing adversities of many kinds, from war to hostile peoples in other lands. Japan's rise to become one of the leading industrial nations of the world by the second half of the 20th century need not obscure the technological backwardness from which this rise began in the 19th century. Trains were unknown to the Japanese when Commodore Perry presented one as a present to an awestruck group of Japanese dignitaries. Yet, a century later, Japan's trains outstripped anything produced in the United States. Large, ocean-going ships had not been built in Japan during the long era when foreign travel was forbidden, and the first steel ship was built in Japan in the 1890s, with the quality of Japanese workmanship being inferior to that of European and American producers. But by 1960, Japan was the world's leading shipbuilder, and by 1969, it was producing half the world's tonnage. A similarly dramatic rise of Japanese products took place in the automobile industry. Although the United States produced more than ten times the number of passenger cars produced in Japan as late as 1965, by 1983 Japanese production exceeded American production, and by 1990 Japan's output of passenger cars was more than 50 percent higher than that of the United States. In photography, it was much the same story. As of 1990, the United States imported more than ten times as much photographic products from Japan as from any other country. Yet the road to these pinnacles was far from smooth, and generations of painful efforts were behind these achievements. Japan was a predominantly agricultural nation when it emerged from its isolation from the rest of the world in the mid-19th century, and it remained so on into the 20th century. As of 1881, Raw silk and tea accounted for more than half the value of Japanese exports, but by 1910, manufactured goods accounted for more than two-thirds of Japan's exports. Still, in terms of people, as late as 1920, more than half the working population of the country worked in agriculture. The passing years, however, saw the transition of the Japanese economy into a more industrial one, first in light industry, such as the production of textiles, bicycles, and other consumer goods, and later into such heavy industry as iron and steel, chemicals, and shipbuilding. Moreover, increased industrial output was accompanied by improvements in the quality of Japanese work, which had been considered below the standards of established industrial nations. Although Japanese industry was largely devastated by American bombing during World War II, making agriculture again the mainstay of the economy during the period of post-war reconstruction, Japan soon resumed its role as an industrial nation and went on to become one of the leading industrial and technological powers of the world. By then, however, large-scale emigration from Japan had come to an end. Most of the emigrants who settled permanently around the world in countries outside the short-lived Japanese empire came from an agricultural Japan and carried with them predominantly agricultural skills. However, in addition to specific skills, they took with them the discipline and capacity for hard work which brought Japan itself to the economic forefront. Japan also had a long tradition of entrepreneurship, so that its historic industrial development was not a product of foreign entrepreneurs, as in so many other countries. This economic initiative also became apparent in the histories of Japanese emigrants who settled overseas.